On my first visit to the Thousand Islands, I became intrigued with the hydrographic charts. I pored over them and I said, why would someone name an island death dealer or blood letter? Why did the international border zig its, zag its way through the islands? So I began asking everybody. I even asked the gas dock boys. Nobody knew the answer. So I went to the library and I started to find material. And I can't tell you how excited I was every time I found one little bit of nugget of information about the Thousand Islands. It got to the point that every cocktail party I went to, people would sort of go away because they knew I'd get started talking about what I knew about the Thousand Islands and I'd bore them to tears. But it didn't take long for me to realize that the islands were more than just a camping spot and things that happened in the islands happened at the beginning of Canadian history that we know today, certainly about Upper Canada and across the river the fledging early United States and northern New York. So I'm going to talk today about place and talk about the appreciation of place, P-L-A-C-E. So the first letter is P, and that stands for past. I can remember the day I was in the reading room in the Montreal Library, and I found a book, and in it was a, a description of the islands written in 1650. The man was the uh, governor general of uh, New France, and he described the islands as nothing was agreeable about them other than their multitude. Thank goodness he isn't here today. My list of remarkable comments and small bits of the past started to grow. Carlton Island, there was a British fort on there and it played an important role in the American Revolution. I found a map that showed how New York State was sold. The largest land sold ever made in the United States included the Thousand Islands, it was the Macomb Purchase, and it was actually sold in a coffee shop in New York City. I found Mrs. Simcoe's diary and a wonderful history of Gananoque. I discovered that there were battles and skirmishes in the War of 1812, and I learned who surveyed the islands. And then I discovered that it was fishing that brought the wealthy gentlemen to the islands and the ladies. That's a picture from the Corbin studio. And the tour boats took ladies on tours while their husbands fished. And I always tell the story of how you can just imagine Mrs. Kelly sitting on the veranda of the Thousand Island Hotel. And she finally said to her husband, you know, if I have to come back next summer and listen to Mrs. McGillicuddy tell me all about her grandchildren, I'm going to go nuts. I want a place of my own. And that's really how homes started to be built on the islands. They stayed in beautiful hotels and some built castles. Religion was always important. And finally, I learned that things changed dramatically when fire began destroying the hotels. I remember the night that I called my grandson, and he told me that he was studying about the War of 1812. And I said, you know, Elliot, he lives in, in New Hampshire. I said, that's a war that your country didn't win. He said, no, no, Grandma. So he called me back the next night, and he said, you know, it's true. I spoke to my teacher and she told me nobody won that war. And so I started to tell him that night all about the wonderful things that had happened in the Thousand Islands. And I got maybe a minute and a half into the conversation, he said, thanks Grandma Ma, gotta go now. So history is not something that learning is really, really a lot of fun. But the next summer, I took him to the Antique Boat Museum for a whole day. I took him one morning to the Arthur Child Center, and then I took him on a three-hour boat tour. And I can tell you to this day that if I talk about how fast boats go or how they were built, he can remember because he saw the posters and he saw the boats at the Antique Boat Museum. If I talk to him about the War of 1812, he starts telling me about the, the uh, uniforms that he saw at the Arthur Child Center. So those experiences made living history, not just learning history. L stands for land. <laughs> I joined the Thousand Islands Land Trust more than two decades ago. That was when they were encouraging teenagers to get on boards. But TILT has been preserving and conserving land for more than 25 years. And there are a few things in my life that have made me as proud as being able to give future generations of islanders the chance to swim at Potter's Beach, or to uh, go on a uh, kayak up Crooked Creek, or go on a bicycle on the 27-mile rails to trails that we have out of Clayton. And there are many, many more special places in this area, people that are stewarding some incredible land. 
New York State Parks Department, the St. Lawrence Islands National Park, the Frontenac Biosphere, the Thousand Islands Watershed Land Trust. These are all places that have taken conserving and preserving the places we love really to heart. Now the next one is A for awareness, and that's probably the most important one that we're going to talk about today. As many of you know, I'm proud to be the editor of TI Life.com. It was Ian Corstein that persuaded me to do it, and it's Ian Corstein that really is behind everything that good that happens in the Thousand Islands, I think. He shares all of his wonderful photographs with us, and my husband does some of the tweaking to do some of the designs. We don't take any advertising. There is absolutely no revenue. Um, but we're performing our mission, and it's a very simple one, building pride in the whole region. And TI Life has highlighted over 40 artists uh, just in the last five years, and those artists have talents that are absolutely tremendous in being able to share that with people up and around and across the river and in fact around the globe is really a great privilege. The next one is C and that's community. We have a tab called The Place on our website and uh, there are 22 communities. Uh, I looked at it yesterday and I thought, oh my God, what happens if someone comes from Prescott or someone comes from Cornwall or someone comes from Morristown? I don't think they're on the site. So if you're here from any, any, of, those site, uh, any of those places that are not highlighted, um, like Hammond, uh, would you please send me pictures and descriptions of those communities because they should be on there. But of the 22 communities that are there, there is tremendous pride in each one of them. Grinnell Island is an example. This past year, they celebrated their 100th birthday, and uh, we ran 10 stories in the magazine on the history of Grinnell Island. But better than that, Lynn McElfresh wrote uh, a history for every single cottage on that island. You can imagine what a gift that is. The last one, which is the letter E. There are two things in the letter E. One is events. I can't tell you how many people appreciate each and every event that goes on in the Thousand Islands over the summer. We have everything from the 4th of July fireworks to festivals to musics to plays. Um, then there's all kinds of fundraising dinners and cocktail parties and golf tournaments. All of those help to bring people outside of their homes and into communities and getting to know each other and again appreciating the place. But the most important E in place, I believe, is everybody. Not everyone is interested in the past, but I'm here today to suggest that you don't have to think about the past, you really have to preserve the present. If what we've started here with RiverQuest could really make a difference in the future, then we've done a tremendous, tremendous job. Before Paul Mallow created TI Life, people had to learn what was happening in their local newspapers. But now we've started to get our readers to ask questions. What is over there? What's on the other side of that island? What's on the other side of that bridge? And we, now, uh, I think in the last five years, people are starting to go over there and to see it and to do other things and building again pride in the Thousand Islands. So if we work together, I used to work as a fundraiser and I, one of my jobs was at McGill University and we had a wonderful man there, a fundraiser named Tom Thompson and he used to say daily, you know what, when the tide rises, all the boats come up. And so if we can all work together, I think the tide will rise and all of us will become more successful. Thank you.